In the second half of this talk, I will address the four lies cultural Marxists are introducing into society. The impact these lies are having are already apparent, but few really understand the full consequences of maintaining these lies on society and the marital family structure. The lies are, one's gender can be wrongly assigned at birth, transgender males and trans women really are women, all gender confused children need to transition immediately, otherwise they will commit suicide, and lastly, there are more than two genders. Now we know that if you spread a lie long and hard enough, it can eventually be accepted as truth as more and more people accept the lie. And if those lies are passed on to the next generation, they become a tradition. Two examples will be that we need to eat meat to get protein and drink milk for healthy bones. That the source of these products, cows eat only grass, seems completely lost in the discussion. As a lie, however, it works very well for the large, intensive farming of the meat and dairy industries, with little said, of course, about the long-term problems associated with high consumption of these products. But eating habits are not the focus of this talk. The focus is on something far more serious. What it means to be a man or woman, what society should look like and how it operates is being redefined along with state invasion of the natural rights of the family and almost no one is contesting the logic and purpose of this redefinition. The cultural Marxist lies are fast becoming a tradition. Even our churches are quiet on the subject and along with our government have sided with the activists, have accepted the lies and seem to be falling over each other to show who can be the most gender friendly. It is cultural Marxists who are behind these activities although they call themselves by different names. Some prefer to be called transgender activists, some prefer social justice warriors, and then of course there is our old friend the feminists and the LGBTQ advocates. The central aim of these groups and others sowing gender confusion is to destroy the family and bring in an atheistic Marxist world order. And they are being incredibly successful. The question is why when Marxism is so wrong on so many levels and has historically bankrupted every country that accepted its false ideology, either freely or by force, do reasonably intelligent people continue to believe in the false promise? The Holocaust killed six million Jews and everyone is aware of the evil of Nazism. But communism killed many, many more all over the world yet is simply seen as an alternative political preference, rather than a deadly ideology that killed over 120 million people and tortured and effectively destroyed the lives of many more. Marxism can only work as an accepted political structure through fear, as is most obvious when looking at North Korea. The subtlety, however, of gender fluidity, same-sex marriage, preferred gender pronouns and other cultural Marxist activities is that it introduces a politically correct thinking acceptable to the West and how now many professionals through fear of being seen to be politically incorrect are self-censoring and towing the gender fluidity line. Rather than the Marxist revolution as in Russia and China we have the slow burning revolution that like the frog being boiled slowly in a pan of water that doesn't realize the danger, we too are mostly unaware of the rising Marxist view gradually being disseminated into our culture. Society is under attack and the threat is real. You might justifiably ask, what is the goal of cultural Marxism? Well, it's to establish the following. Identity politics oppressed minorities, gender politics, gay rights, gay marriage, the abolition of binary categories, gender fluidity, abolition of the family, abolition of free speech, abolition of religion, and the destruction of education. And it aims to achieve this using the same kind of ideological garbage that drove the Soviet Union, China and other Marxist dictatorships in their darkest moments. None of these transgender activists dare read the Gulag Archipelago by Alexander Solzhenitsyn 
or look critically at North Korea or Russia before the wall collapsed. But of course, even if they did, it wouldn't count because it's not real communism. Only European and American Marxists understand what real communism is, even though their behavior and strategy mimics everything that went on behind these iron curtains. Many university students and young, young adults are completely unaware that a regime with the same kind of ideological claptrap as that driving their current agenda killed over 40 million in Russia at the hands of their own leaders. 65 million killed in China, two million each in Vietnam and North Korea. And that still leaves millions killed in Eastern Europe, Africa and Afghanistan, along with many more who were tortured, leaving lives and families blighted for generations. And these cultural Marxists here are trying to sell us their vision as a caring lot? Is this some kind of sick joke or what? It's time we woke up from this daydream because if we continue down this road, then for sure it's gonna turn into a nightmare and it will be our children and their children who will pay the price for our blindness and inaction. To be clear, <clears throat> The expressed aim of all these cultural Marxist activities is to break down families and to get people to rely more and more on the state as society crumbles under their destructive activities. And as can be seen by Corbyn's support group Momentum, they are seeking to take control of the Labour Party so that once in power they can pursue their ideological agenda. Marxism is a deeply anti-religious ideology because religion aims to make people free. Marxism is about control, just as Vladimir Lenin said, to trust is good, but to control is better. By 1941 in Russia, only 500 of the 54,000 churches remained, and many of these had political appointed leaders rather than true religious elders. Alexander Kollontai said in 1920, the workers' state will come to replace the family. The obligations of parents to their children will wither away gradually until finally society assumes full responsibility. And he said, marriage? It's given way to the free and honest union of men and women who are lovers and comrades. Vladimir Lenin also said, atheism is a natural and inseparable part of Marxism of the theory and practice of scientific socialism. And from Nikolai Bukharin, communism is incompatible with the religious faith. And lastly, from Alexander Solzhenitsyn. In our country, that's Russia, the lie has become not just a moral category, but a pillar of the state. And recently, the Labour MP, David Lammy, equated those trying to ban same-sex marriage with the practice of slavery. And instead of challenging this, Harriet Baldwin, a conservative MP and minister at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, simply said she fully accepts the eloquent way in which MP Lamy makes his case. This is yet another example of how lies are being uncritically disseminated into the political language of our time and how traditional supporters of marriage are being characterized as transphobic bigots well-meaning people without a viable alternative view have accepted and are accepting in full the lie that those who seek to transform the very idea of marriage and society. Regarding gender fluidity theory, something being pushed very hard along with raising children gender neutral, let's start with a few basics. A man, no matter how hard he tries, can never become a woman. Why? Because his last 23rd sex chromosome is designated XY, whereas the female sex chromosome is XX. And these chromosomes dictate and work throughout the body from conception to give the different male and female attributes. These sex hormones are in every one of the 37 trillion cells that make up our bodies and can be seen to guide the fetus along the path to a male or female form from about the fifth week of pregnancy. Can a transgender man produce a human egg? No. Does he have a womb? No. 
Can he have a baby? No. Can a transgender woman produce sperm? No. Can a man become a woman? Clearly, the answer at the cellular and genetic level is an emphatic no. Men compared to men and women compared to women are 99.9% .9 similar from a genetic standpoint. A man and woman have, however, only 98.2% similar DNA. And a man and a chimpanzee have 98.7% similar DNA. It just goes to show how different genetically men are from women, in that men and chimpanzees are a closer genetic match. That 1.8% difference equates to 59 million base pair DNA genetic differences. It is impossible to change the makeup of a person's DNA. It just can't be done and never will be possible. A man is and always will be a man. A man who wants to be a woman will always be just a man pretending to be a woman or a woman pretending to be a man. However, we live in a free society and if a person wants to pretend to be of the opposite sex, then actually that's fine. The problem is when in law we say a man can be a woman and is entitled to be treated as such and enter all spheres of the female world. What is perhaps less understood is that when children are born they have not only a male and female physical form but also an invisible male or female internal nature. Children when born do not have a gender neutral internal nature. The brain of a male and female child grows in different ways, with males having greater front to back connections, while females have more left to right connections. It is our sex hormones that guide the body to best enable the physical form to correspond and most fully align with the workings of our internal nature. Good mental health can be derived when the internal nature and the external form are united, when they come together. It is a process and part of growing up. It is when these two aspects come together we find confidence in who we are. Becoming a true man or true woman, however, is only part of the story. As a man, I am half a part of the whole. My wife is the other part of the whole. It is by coming together as husband and wife that we fully realize the complete human being, combining the complementary aspects of both male and female. It is in these moments when male and female come together naturally in the fullest and deepest way that we resonate and reflect the divine nature that gives us existence in the first place. This is the reason why so many religious people are opposed to same-sex marriage. They understand a more complete view of the purpose of life. And it is through the give and take of husband and wife, male and female, that we produce the next generation, something transgender and same-sex couples can never do naturally. Transgender activists, driven by Marxist agendas, are trying to rewrite what it means to be male and female, what it means to be human, by saying there is no specific internal nature. Because Marxism does not recognize the internal aspects or anything of a spiritual nature, then they fail to understand the greater purpose of life and how positive emotions and a more fulfilled life can be experienced when these dual aspects come together properly and in a deep way. Marxist ideology, at its root, focuses on the external only, and as our internal and external aspects are driven further and further apart, then positive emotions and the contentment of living a well-balanced life become more and more difficult. The word gender, of course, is used now much more than talking about one's sex, because gender implies what we think or feel about our sex. It purposely separates the biological, physical aspect of our being with our internal, invisible nature. And the gender ideologue will say, it's okay to feel different. It's simply because you were born in the wrong body. So just change your body. Take hormone replacements, which by the way, will eventually make you infertile and produce long-term medical conditions. Have surgery to cut off or add body parts. 
This trend is so pervasive that unthinking parents are taking four to seven year old children to transitioning clinics. Bizarre, totally bizarre. These parents are bringing untold harm and trauma to the child once they grow up and realize what their parents have done to them. Consider this if you think transgender people feel comfortable with themselves. The national average for suicide in the UK is 0.0094%, and that's roughly one in 10,000. Specifically, 6,188 people committed suicide in 2015 in the UK. In Britain, 48% of transgender people had attempted suicide at least once in their lives. The prevalence of suicide remains high among transgender persons, irrespective of disclosing their transgender status to others and undergoing sex reassignment surgery. The national average for people attempting suicide is 0.21% taken from the NHS suicide fact sheet. This clearly shows that being transgender results in an extremely high rate of suicide, whether they openly relate as transgender or not, in fact, 228 times greater risk, actually. To impose a transgender ideology as an accepted normal sexual orientation and behavior is therefore extremely damaging, especially to young, vulnerable people. Nationally, in Great Britain, 0.4% of adults see themselves as other than just male or female, taken from the national census. This means that 99.6% are happy to be referred to as either male or female, man or woman, boy or girl. Then why do the LGBTQ lobby and demand getting transgender sexual orientation and sexual behavior forced by law to be taught to all children starting while in primary school? even though the expected behavior and preferences will only occur within a minority group with an absolute maximum of 0.4% of the population. So why does the government and even our Archbishop Justin Welbin believe these atheistic Marxist lies? Why should we legally be forced to confuse all our children at a young age who are not even interested or even aware of transgender issues? And that as said in the film, I, Robot to Will Smith, is the right question. The central aim of all the current work by LGBTQ followers and those other groups sowing gender confusion, whether they realize it or not, is to destroy God's second blessing as found in Genesis 1.28. Regarding creating a family through marriage between a man and a woman and producing children as a natural consequence of their love for each other. Same-sex marriage and gender fluidity theory has placed into the legal framework laws that will bring about an increasing weakening of society and social decay. The law substantially redefines the meaning of the second blessing and in doing so is destroying all the foundations that are essential for marriage to work and ensures that fewer people will succeed in building a marital family. How do we know this? because every time the state has previously got involved in redefining the inner laws that allow for the success of marriage and family, the following years saw a growing rise in divorces and cohabitation. People became less capable of building the structure that best protects children, the next generation, and ever increasing numbers of children paid and continue to pay the price. In the next few years, we will be asked to confirm the following lies, all of which will cause immense damage to the social fabric once they are substantiated within the law or in policies. Future generations of women especially will suffer if these lies are acceptable. There is absolutely no compassion in these laws, only far more damage. They can be summarized as following. Number one, there are more than two genders. Number two, men can become women, and women can become men. Three, it's best to transition children as soon as possible with schools being allowed to let children cross-dress without any form of psychological or evaluation and counseling. Four, it's good to read books about transsexuality in schools. And five, something being pushed very much right now. It is best to encourage children to grow up gender neutral until they decide who they want to be. If we're not careful, 
and we do not speak up to, up to uphold traditional values and the sanctity of traditional marriage, then soon it will be too late. Too many laws and policies made on each of these lies will be in place. Gender fluid theory suggests the idea that gender is purely a mental construct. If a man says he is a woman, he is a woman. Why is it so important we reject this idea? Why is it so important that we keep the natural idea that the basis of being a wholesome man is that he can identify himself as a unified being consisting of an inner male identity and an external male form? Why is it so important that we keep the natural idea that the basis of being a wholesome woman is that she can identify herself as a unified being consisting of an inner female identity and an external female form? It's because of the developmental needs of the child. Everything about our sexual nature exists solely for the benefit of the child, not for ourselves. Without the external biology of the male and female, a child cannot even be born. And the child is best served by having both male and female parents, each with their own gender-specific identities. The testosterone-driven father with his brain having fewer connections between the two halves, as we've said, more front to back of his brain, offers the child different developmental opportunities than the oxytocin-driven, much more networked brain of the mother. The child benefits from both types of input, the different types of love they offer. The child does not benefit from their mother's female gifts of love if that mother is just a man pretending to be a woman. The child just gets warped male tainted gifts of love. The child's development is more likely to be warped too. But gender fluid theory is what you end up with when you first, in the law, disconnect orgasms from the conception of children, as we have done in same-sex marriage. When sexuality is consistently talked about in ways that solely focus on what adults feel and want, when the child is not recognized as being part of sexual expression even within the law, then you can play mind games with adult sexual expression to your heart's content. All of this just harms a child who gets neglected in the discussion. The transgender, politically correct activist has at the heart of their ideology four lies. And they are one, the lie. One's gender can be wrongly assigned at birth. Parents are being encouraged to be wary of assigning gender based on the baby's genitalia. They are being asked to consider that maybe their penis baby is actually a girl trapped in a boy's body. And that they should be respectful in case the child grows up, preferring to be a different gender. It's best, therefore, to raise the child gender neutral. Now, there may be, on rare occasions, that a child does grow up identifying as lesbian or gay but lesbians still identify as women, and gay men still identify as men. Denying the opportunity for your son the chance to become a wholesome father, husband or brother just because there is a 0.001% chance they may wish to transition later in life is wrong 99.999% of the time. Pushing the raising of children gender neutral by social progressives have the goal of weakening the ability of the next generation to build long-lasting marital families. This being so, the idea that children can be assigned the wrong gender of birth, when believed by unthinking parents, is extremely toxic to the social fabric. It is being pushed extremely hard in the media and in the education system. The purpose of the lie, the gender can be wrongly assigned at birth, is to make sure that everyone becomes totally confused. And in that confusion, laws and policies will be passed that make both immoral and mentally confused people into healthy individuals and turn wholesome people into nasty, deranged people because they keep saying how dangerous the laws and policies are for society. In that confusion, with the increasing number of parents not encouraging their children to find a wholesome relationship between their mind and body, increasing numbers of children who grow up and find it harder to build a lasting marriage so as to best protect their children. Social chaos is assured, all in the name of trying to be tolerant and accepting of some one in 10,000 people, when in reality we should be encouraging them to go through extensive counselling. So number two, the lie. 
transgender males and trans women really are women. There has been a push to allow men and boys who just say they feel like a woman or a girl into the female bathrooms and showers in schools, universities, companies, swimming pools and more, even if the male feels like a woman just for a day. All this is acceptable. No diagnosis by any health professional is needed. No hormones need to be taken. No body parts need to be removed. Eventually, it will become law enforced upon all citizens in developed nations unless a clear, unequivocal stand is made by citizens now. So why would feminism want to promote trans theory when it actually demonizes wholesome women just for being who they are? It's because, as always, feminism was taken over by cultural Marxists a long time ago. And these social progressives now see trans theory as a way to cause even more havoc in society and thus gain even more power. Trans theory is a much more powerful tool for gaining control over society than feminism is. Gaining political power through becoming the owner of the definition of a man and woman is real power. And that power, when in the hands of politicians, the judiciary and leaders of social organisations, can be used for political goals. A woman is an essential part of traditional marriage. Why? Only a woman has a womb, produces a human egg and is capable of female type love. A man pretending to be a woman cannot do any of these things. The only way a man can become a woman is to redefine the word woman to mean something completely different. The new definition in effect says that all these aspects of what a woman actually is play no role. Such a definition of course is ridiculous, but that is what we are being forced to accept by law. Redefining womanhood would ensure that the female body disappears from within the law and in social discussions. We will all become solely that which our mind says we are. If there are only people who think they are men, women, or neither, then because of gender fluidity, all laws can only apply to people. In the law, we will all become desexed, for to have a law which applies only to one sex would be discriminatory. Men could go anywhere in the woman's normal sphere of privacy, and vice versa. A woman's body would become public property, owned by the state, with the state telling her who can watch her undress. As you can see, Though many ideas in this debate have not been fully explored, an immense amount of damage will be done to society if politicians and policy makers start treating men who in any small way claim to be women as if they are real women. The same goes for, trans, for treating trans men as if they are real men. Might they suffer depression for not being accepted into the biological sex they seek to look like? Well, maybe, but this is not our fault. They have free will. There are a growing number of ways to deal with gender dysphoria or gender identity disorder, other than transitioning. The damage to society of accepting the lie that they really have changed sex will be immense. We really cannot afford to go there. Society will collapse. One has to still maintain what has always been the case, that individuals who struggle with dysphoria have psychological issues that have to be dealt with. We have to also clearly state that even if a person transitions to look like a person of the opposite sex, they cannot ever change their sex in reality. So number three, the lie. All gender confused children need to transition immediately, otherwise they'll commit suicide. This is simply not true and there is absolutely no evidence to back up this lie. But schools are now becoming actively involved in encouraging temporarily confused children to get into hormones with the idea of eventually transitioning. The problem is that we treat these children with the same remedies as adults with long-term dysphoria. This can only lead to tragic results for these children who, once they finally stop being confused, now find may be themselves sterile, with unwanted body parts, with permanent health issues and lifelong depression, just because no one really waited to find out if their confusion was permanent or not. We have children as young as four years of age being guided towards transitioning, and that includes surgery. 
with the children absolutely unaware of the physical or mental dangers that lie ahead. As gender fluid theory has taken hold, far fewer are being referred for counselling and many more are ending up in transitioning clinics. In the UK, the number of children being referred to transi for transitioning has grown from a few hundred 75 years ago to well over 2,000 today. 80 of these children were between three and seven years old. Once one understands the damage that is being done to these helpless children and women and society, you might like to ask why no one can stop it. Redefining marriage is a Marxist coup in disguise. In redefinition, we entered into a totalitarian age. The government sadly sided with same-sex marriage activists and now all decent people who wish to protect children are now seen to be bigoted, nasty people. Now, in the gender fluid debate, as the activists win victory after victory without the government stepping in to stop them, decent people who see the damage are labeled transphobic. We now have teachers, the police, psychologists, and many more professionals living in fear of saying something that is politically incorrect. This is how it was under Stalin and Mao, and is painfully obvious now in North Korea, when we see the exaggerated expressions of admiration for their current leader, Kim Jong-un. This just allows the activists free reign to implement their child-harming strategies all across the social fabric. All because the state has passed laws that say all those who want to protect children are nasty people, a state-enforced, warped morality of who is good and who is bad. An authoritarian society is born and society will increasingly come under the dominion of forces that wish to create untold harm to future society. All in the name of gaining power, and many of those who represent us are now in on this totalitarian thrust. Did I mention Corbyn already? So what should we be doing then with these confused children instead? Ideally, we should just leave them alone like we've always done. We do not need to talk about gender fluidity in schools. Instead, we talk about different personality types. The nurturers, the guardians, the creatives, the pioneers, the connectors, and many more. We teach girls that there are many different ways of being female, and each form of womanhood has its own strengths, and that there are many successful women within each personality type. We help children identify and value and treasure those inner elements that correspond with their biological body. And we help boys find their natural male personality too. The goal of the social progressives as they push gender fluidity in the school system is to get as many children to transition as possible before the public get to understand the true damage that is being done. This way, more laws will be made and the confusion will be embedded into society. The goal is to also ensure that the ideology is embedded into the education system. This will cause the next generation to grow up and to embed it even deeper into society. They are the future social justice warrior leaders. With the state saying gender fluidity is healthy, with the education system saying the same, in many places the church saying the same, then who can fight back? In summary, the acceptance and teaching of gender fluid theory in the education system will cause it to spread out into society. Many, many children will end up getting seriously hurt. The theory does far more damage than it heals. But that is, and always was, the intention. So number four, the lie, there are more than two genders. In the former USSR, one of the ways to break the will of dissidents was torture. Torturers would hold up five fingers and ask the dissident to acknowledge that there are only four fingers being shown. The dissident was then tortured until they acknowledged that only four fingers were actually being shown. At that point, the torturers knew that the spirit of the dissident was broken, that the dissident was so afraid of being tortured again that they would not fight against a delusional communist system again. Under the tyranny of fear, people say what the state tells them to say. So are there only two sexes, or are there more? By stating within the law that there are more than two sexes, 
the state has successfully taken upon itself two unnatural rights. It has taken on the right to invent reality and keep that invented right in place through fear. It has also taken on the right to tell citizens what they have to say in their personal relationships. And both these powers can be expanded upon again and again in its future dealings with citizens. People end up living in fear of talking honestly about various important social issues. The worrying issue for society is that enforced speech codes have always been seen as the starting point of the building of an authoritarian society. All oppressive societies have made laws about what people can and can't say. People live in fear of saying what they know to be true. Social cohesion is therefore hard, very hard. Just as the growth of homosexual behaviour has always been seen as a sign that the culture is on its last legs, the ending of freedom of speech has always been seen to be a precursor to the growth of a totalitarian state. It is one thing to force people to not say some things. It is a completely different story to force people to say things against their common sense. The fact that this power has already been grabbed by political forces in Canada, New York, California and other places does not bode well for the future. Once citizens allow lawmakers to invent reality right down to the individual level, political forces then come to own the idea of what it means to be human. Now, under political dominion, large areas of life move from being under natural law to come under legislative law. With the concept of the individual being owned by political forces, this allows the state to break through the protective barrier that natural rights offer the marital family. When this happens, all family relationships become subject to legal intrusion. In many countries, same-sex marriage caused the term mother and father to be stripped from legal documents. This third gender pronouns just cause a further assault on natural rights. When the state takes control of how we define ourselves as individuals and controls what we have to say to each other, then we all become atomized citizens and individuals. The state controls us as individuals, even in our private lives, even in our family, rather than natural law of me having the freedom to do and say that which I believe is good for my family. State ownership over the concept of man and woman brings the state into all family relationships. And if you think that state invasion of your family, once given, will stop with what you must call your children, you're mistaken. With the precedent set, political forces can now play games with your family as never before. Gender fluid theory, same-sex marriage, and everything regarding transsexual identity has but one purpose. It is to redefine what is the very core of building a last and functional society. The family is the smallest building block of a society, not the individual. Without families, we have no society or the foundation to raise wholesome people. Take children out of the concept of marriage, which is what the state has done with same-sex marriage, then only bad consequences can result. atheistic Marxist theory, strategy, and the infiltration of cultural Marxists into the foundational organizations of education, government, media, and the general judiciary, as has happened in Canada, will cause a gradual but continued decline of society as we currently understand it. Increased costs of social welfare to cater for dysfunctional families, and an ever-increasing mental health problem as individuals fail to bring together their internal nature and external form. We can see already this growing unnatural power of the state. It is becoming evident in many places, especially the unnatural power through the abuse of children and babies on citizens who cannot vote for something different. For example, a few politicians a long time ago, like Julius Caesar's and Caesar and King Herod, determined they had the right to say that a baby could have its natural right to life taken away from it. A few politicians in more recent times, 
then went on to proclaim they had the right to deny a child its natural right to the love of its biological mother and father through the power of social services and politically correct observance. A few politicians then went on to say they had the power to say that children could be bought and sold through IVF and surrogacy. A few politicians then said they have the natural right to allow a child to be raised by two men, even if the child doesn't want it. And a few politicians have now decided they have the right to enforce the teaching of same-sex sexuality in classrooms, something that is known to have serious detrimental physical and mental health issues connected to it, and that they have more power than parents in this area. Along with many other abuses against children, the state is now allowing for the extreme abuse of children by immediately sending off any temporarily confused children to gender reassignment clinics. One of the core issues here is that every one of these abuses of power leads to growing numbers of children suffering. Future social outcomes are consistently worsening along with the ability to create marital families and growing national debts. You cannot hurt so many children and expect future social outcomes to be improved. So what can be done? It is our politicians who have decided to accept the lies of cultural Marxists and the emboldened LGBTQ ideologues. Lobby your local MP, lobby your children's school head teachers and do your bit to stop these people destroying our children and the potential for them to raise beautiful, traditional, mentally sound families. These cultural Marxists are not going to stop unless those who understand the danger counter their lies with the truth and make an effort to expose these Marxist ideologues. I'll finish this talk with a quote by Rob Slane. He said, Orwell knew nothing. He did not hold a candle to this. The system he envisaged set out to break a man to crush his will, but it was still a man that was being broken. What's going on today is not an attempt to break a man, but to redefine man completely. Man has become morph, and he is so malleable that he can be refashioned in any which way the zeitgeist demands. Lop a bit off here, add it on there, take a bit off there, add it on here, squish it all together, and there you have it. Morph is now Susan, and she's husband to her husband, Brenda. And together they are both mother to Harriet, who is herself the world's first transgender baby. Today's creeping dystopia is not Orwellian, but Unwellian. That is, it shows that our society is really unwell. And it is only the deep roots of Christian cultural influence which have permeated our society for over a thousand years that keep some semblance of normality going. But since the whole point of the cultural Marxism that spawned male wives, female husbands and transgender children with four mothers and two sperm donors is to tear those roots out of the ground and burn them on the sacrificial altar of the great God, tolerance and diversity. What then? What happens when the roots are burned and the experiment begins to reach its zenith? Any idea? The cultural Marxist says utopia. Everything else cries dystopia or just cries.